Hi, I'm John Atak. I'm Sam Atak. And uh, we're elated. <laughs> elated. Prove it. <laughs> elated. Elated. Yeah. yeah. Deflated. Um, elongated. No. Something like. And today we're going to talk about one of the most influential artists in all history. Damien Hirst. No. Uh, not Damien Hirst. Guess again. Kandinsky. I thought you were going to say Tracy E. <laughs> no, no. Um, I felt like getting it right the second time. This, in 1999, there was a poll in the United Kingdom to determine who the most influential musician of the last thousand years was. And the answer was Robbie Williams. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I happened to, to mention this to a guy and, and he looked at me and said, yeah, but you've got to admit he's brilliant. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, maybe, but... Uh, Not influential, really. <laughs> who invented music notation? Yeah, who, that's it's a bit... Who made the piano? Come yeah. on. Beethoven, Beethoven maybe had a bit more influence. Berlioz probably had a bit more influence than Robbie Williams. Hmm. But um, Leonan, the man who first put two voices together in counterpoint yeah, in the beautiful. 11th century, isn't it amazing? The things that... 11th century? It took yeah. them that long. The Notre they? Dame School, yeah. People had probably done it before then, but there's no record of it because... Ah. Yeah. Um, CDs weren't invented until the 12th century. Ah, yeah. Records, CDs. Awful. Some people will believe anything. We're going to talk about Vasily or Vasiliev Kandinsky, who was a Russian lawyer. That, is that all he did? At the age of 33, um, Kandinsky saw an exhibition of Monet's. Um, series paintings, the haystacks. Monet's idea was to basically paint, it started with the Poplar series, to paint things in different lights because he was interested in the atmosphere more than he was in the object. And um, Kandinsky saw these paintings, he'd just been offered a professorship and he would have been the, I believe, the youngest professor of law in all of the Russias at the age of 33. And he declined the offer and instead uh, went to Munich in uh, Bavaria, South Germany, and studied painting. I mean, he obviously had some money coming from somewhere that he was able to just wander off and do this. Still a lawyer. Yeah. I think he probably came from a relatively wealthy family, ah, as right, well, yes, I well. guess, you know. Um, he took up with a, a wonderful woman called Gabriella Munter, and, um, who was also a fine painter. And he painted little fairy tale pictures that came out of, of the Russian periods in sort of dots and dabs, and they're okay, they're quite interesting. Um, it's very much a part of what was happening, the, the nationalism of the time, doing art that's to do with, you know, your hmm. country. Um, so, you know, Sibelius is, is doing Finland, and um, Dvorak's doing what will ultimately become the Czech Republic. Um, Vaughan Williams is collecting folk songs in England and, and setting them. Uh, so is Gustav Holst, his best mate, who despite having a German name was an Englishman. It's very confusing mm. sometimes. So was um, Delius, German parents. Yeah. Grew up in England, though. Um, this, so it's a period of nationalism, and he's painting these little um, fairy tale pictures, and they're quite cute, you know. And then uh, he goes to a place called Murnau. This is in 1908. And... <clears throat> While he's there, he's painting these kind of expressionist landscapes, you know, these high colour landscapes, very much in the, the school of, of Gauguin, really very much following on what Gauguin um, had been doing for 20 years leading up to that, um, you know, when he was teaching Van Gogh and, and after that period too. And <clears throat> one evening he came in at twilight and one of his paintings was standing on its side and he saw it in the twilight, and he couldn't make out what it was. Mm. Now, <clears throat> if we're going to get technical, the rods and cones in your eyes switch over. Mm. And so uh, actually your eyesight in dim light is confused because both rods and cones are operating. So huh? he probably didn't know that, uh, Paul Kandinsky. Um, Basili, by the way, is, is a way of saying Basil. You know, if huh? you prefer that. Um, Basil Kandinsky. Basil Kandinsky. Basil? <laughs> Um, and he realised that a painting needn't be about anything 
that it could mm. be a pure aesthetic object. And this was a blinding revelation. Mm. It led him in 1910 to, to make his first abstract watercolour. And in most art history books, he's regarded as the, um, the beginning of abstract painting. I, I personally would question that. I think it's a bit more complicated than that. And the reason it's a bit more complicated than that is that the early Kandinsky's, as demonstrated by a brilliant scholar called Rose Carroll Washington Long, and if you're out there, brilliant, absolutely brilliant, um, Rose Carroll, um, she showed that uh, Kandinsky was actually taking objects and putting them, using them to abstract. Ah, yes, yeah, so you can see a little boat. That's it. And the, the famous Troika, the little sledge that mm. you'll find, but yeah, the, the rowboat is one of the things. And and he was abstracting. Mm. And this is called abstractive rather than abstract art. Mm. So you start with a flower and make something that doesn't look like a flower, you've abstracted it. You start with colour, yeah. then which is yeah, my own work is Oh, it's uh, behind you! you. <laughs> yeah. um, is entirely, God. almost entirely abstract. Mm. Though I, I, I have been known to draw faces like the Jimi Hendrix, yeah. the cover of the novel no, Voodoo Child. I did draw that. Did you find it? I haven't found the original. No, it's it's yeah. it's lost in space. I can't oh, even God. find the, the photo I took of it. It's terrible. Um, but yeah, if anybody wants to, know, I can actually draw because that people do yeah. get worried. They look at look at the thing and go, "Well, yeah, does he know how to make art?" You David know? Hensel approved of it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the great David Hensel approved of the drawing. He said, "Oh, that's not bad." Something like that. <laughs> there you go. Which is high praise indeed. Now he liked it. Yeah. But Kandinsky gets to the centre of what's called the Blauer Reiter Group, Gruppe, mm. the Blue Rider Group, and in 1912 in Munich they have this astonishing exhibition. In the group, you have August Macker, uh, Franz Marc, the astonishing German painter, uh, Paul Klee, Gabriela Munter, and even the composer Schoenberg and um, the painter Jolensky. They're a bunch of people together, and they have this incredible show. And by this time, Kandinsky has worked out how to make his compositions. These will be the great works of his first period. Uh, composition 5, 6 and 7, uh, all three of which are in the... Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Curiously, I didn't see them when I was there, but I've seen them twice before in, in travelling shows, and they are mind-bogglingly wonderful as far as I'm concerned. What then happened was World War I, mm. and all of the Blue Rider group had presumed that an apocalypse was on its way. Oh. Um, and they thought it would be cleansing. <laughs> Shit. But, of okay. course, August Macca was thoroughly cleansed from this earth, uh, and so was Franz Marc. They both died during the, the conflict, as, of course, did a huge amount of the significant artists and poets of generation. How did they think it could be cleansing? I th th there was a notion in Germany that, that German culture was the high culture, mm. you know, the philosophers, the musicians, and that, that they were going to bring what they called socialism, which is not what we call socialism now. They weren't a democracy, even. Mm. But they were going to have, you know, social medicine. They were going to have social care, and they believed that they were going to bring their superior society to the rest of the world. Um, and I think it's that enthusiasm and, and the idea of good versus evil, that Manichaean yeah. menace, that that took Europe into this utter carnage, um, that that you know resolved pretty much nothing. Mm. made the world a much worse place. Possibly the only good thing about it was that it brought the aristocracy down a peg or two. Yeah. And um but 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 the, that process had been happening anyway. In nineteen twelve you had the People's Act in Britain which was moving towards um you know a, a more rational well yeah. I'm not gonna get into socialism because the word's so loaded, but it was moving towards democracy. Yeah. Yeah. Um where you wouldn't have a house of lords hmm. ruling over things, where the king wouldn't have any say whatsoever in what was happening in the country. And we've moved towards that. Yeah. You know, um, but the First World War took um, a third of young men from the poorer families and two-thirds from the rich families. Oh, shit. Here where we live, there's a memorial garden um, dedicated by a family that lost... Their heir, mm. the family died out, 
um, with the loss of the young man. Kandinsky, during that period, goes to Russia. He uh, believes that the revolution will um, transform Russian society, as so many people believed. And in fact, of course, they had the, the dictatorship of Lenin. And both Kandinsky and Chagall had to flee Russia. Uh, having worked in the Ministry of Culture, they're now told that what they're doing is decadent and they mustn't do it anymore. I believe, and I've said elsewhere, there's a, a website called johnatak.com, which has been floating out there 15 years unattended. Um, it's had nothing added to it in that time because we can't get into it. Uh, but it's still out there. But there are things that I've written there that I believe that basically the First World War was such a traumatic event that um, human civilization has never recovered from it. We then got the Second World War and art shifted over um, from being an exploration of all human feelings into it being, well, you know, basically human beings are beastly and horrible. So high art is about angst and anxiety and about the horror of being human or the pointlessness of Tracy Eamon. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. We can edit that yeah, out, sorry. I hope, Spike. Oh, sorry. <sighs> Being rude. Yeah, sorry. About rude. Tracy. Yeah. But sorry, she really triggered something in me. Yeah. <laughs> what can we say? You know, the, for those who are not familiar with Tracy, I mean, she came to fame by exhibiting her unmade bed. Mm. And um, two young men were arrested for jumping up and down on the unmade bed. <laughs> in the museum, and it all had to be then put back, you know. Yeah, to where it was, including her unwashed pants and ah, okay. various other detritus that she did. Yeah. She then uh, did a, a, a tent in which she lovingly pasted the names of every man she'd had sex with. Um, several of them hadn't told their wives. Um, and uh, she misspelled the title of it, which I thought was particularly yes. charming. Um, but m m my... Uh, my conflict with Tracy Eamon is, is also to be found on the website oh, yes. where, where there is a, a little little piece about her. And I'm very sorry, Tracy. I didn't mean you any harm. It's, it's nothing personal and insulting you personally. Mm. Kandinsky basically lost heart, moved away from his original explorations and made... There are two later periods. I think he dies in 1944, eventually. Um, and you have... you. Know, different representations of his work. For me, his early work is, is really important stuff. And we're going to end off here with the recommendation that, that um, we'll stick on pictures of composition five, composition six, and the final ah. composition, the last thing he did uh, before World War One struck, uh, composition seven. Um, I hope that this uh, interests you um, and because uh, it's fascinated me <laughs> since I was a kid since I was a teenager and first saw Kandinsky and found him tremendously inspiring and I hope that somewhere out there somebody is inspired by by what we're doing because inspiration is better than angst and um, the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction as William Blake <laughs> if you said so. I haven't met any of these tigers or horses but they probably are or the horses of again. Instruction. The tigers of wrath, the angry tigers, are yeah. wiser than the, the teacher horses. Okay. Yeah, William Blake was a yeah. bit weird. <laughs> um, who knows? Maybe he was thinking about the Hunans yeah, in um, uh, Gulliver's yeah. Travels. Thank you very much for abiding with us, and mm. um, we'll see you the very next time we see you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm John Azak. I'm Sally Tack. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much. She really triggered something in me.